computer, just a product, a tool. If you're environmentally conscious, you might put it in power save at the end of the day or take it to a recycler when it breaks. Now think about your computer as an organism. Its DNA is in its intellectual property. Its skeleton is made of gold, steel, plastics, flame retardants. It was born in a factory, migrated to your home, and over the course of its life will consume a steady diet of electricity from fossil fuels until it dies and decomposes in a recycling facility or landfill. When we change our perspective on a product as we use it to instead consider this entire life cycle, we get better insight on how to reduce its environmental footprint. For your computer, the biggest impact doesn't occur when you push the power button. It's actually the huge amounts of energy and material required to produce the tiny semiconductors inside, which means we can't just make a more efficient device. We also have to look at green design and manufacturing. Now, the idea of drawing an analogy from a product to an organism life cycle is one of the key ideas in the field of industrial ecology. Now, you might be wondering what do indust industry and ecology have to do with each other, but the basic idea is that we try to study how materials and energy cycle in an industrial system in the same way that an ecologist might study a natural system. Now, since this field was started about 20 years ago, it slowly gained some traction in industry and even in universities. When I came to RIT in 2009, I was asked to teach a course on industrial ecology. And one day, as I was preparing my materials, I took the textbook home with me. And my husband, who is actually trained as an ecologist, picked it up, flipped through it, and then made the comment that this only begins to scratch the surface of what ecologists actually think about. When I asked him to tell me more, I was envisioning a short dinner conversation. I never imagined that this idea would take hold and become the inspiration of my research. But I was fascinated to learn how ecologists study the interaction of organisms and ecosystems in nature, how they convert solar energy, continuously cycle nutrients and wastes, evolve to minimize competition over scarce resources, or even maximize cooperation. And it dawned on me that these are the same kinds of challenges that our society faces right now. So I teamed up with some wonderful collaborators and students at RIT to really dive into ecology and seek out inspiration for sustainable products and technologies. And along the way, I also learned that looking at industrial problems through an ecological lens can shift some of our fundamental ideas about sustainability. For example, we often think that getting consumers to buy into sustainability means that we have to provide them with a product that is both environmentally friendly and inexpensive. Well, let's think about your computer again. Over the last 20 years, it's become increasingly energy efficient to both manufacture and use this device, and it's certainly become cheaper. But the net environmental impact keeps going up. Why? If your household is anything like mine, you don't just own one computer. You've also got TVs, cameras, printers, tablets, and phones. We can't just look at a computer. An ecologist would never study a single species in isolation without taking the ecosystem into account. So we analyzed the entire ecosystem of electronics in the United States and found that over the last 20 years, Households have gone from owning four to over 20 of these devices. We keep accumulating old ones in basements, spare rooms. You know it's true. We've doubled the amount of time spent glued to their screen. And as a result, the net impact has actually gone up by over 300%. So we asked ourselves, does nature offer innovation for disrupting this system? What if we introduced an invasive species? 
Now, in ecology, invasives are a huge problem. They come into an ecosystem, outcompete the native species for resources, and all of the biodiversity and productivity are lost. But how much diversity do we really need in our product systems? Instead of owning this wide array of redundant gadgets, could we get our same entertainment, communication, and work done with just a handful of multifunctional products, like tablets and smartphones? There's a huge opportunity for green design of a sustainable invasive product. Now, if you want to reduce the impact of your product ecosystem, the first step is cutting consumption. But you should also round up all of those old products you have lying around and take them to an electronics recycler. You might wonder what happens to it at that point. Well, the conventional sustainability wisdom is that it should be taken apart to the extent possible so that we can reuse components and recycle valuable metals. This works OK for large devices like computers, but our product ecosystem is evolving towards smaller, lightweight tablets and phones, which are much more labor intense to disassemble. Electronics recyclers face new decisions in how to collect and handle this waste stream. And we believe that these are the same kinds of decisions that animals make when deciding how to collect and eat their food. A foraging squirrel can search over a wide range for the most nutritionally dense nuts, or they can eat a lot of nuts that are easily at hand. In either case, they're trying to maximize the energy gained from eating compared to the energy it took to obtain the food. When we applied this optimal foraging theory to electronic waste, we found that as products get smaller, it becomes more energy efficient and cost effective to automate, shred the materials, and reduce handling time, even if you get a slightly lower yield than disassembly. Now, these examples are just the beginning. The possibilities are as diverse as nature itself. Imagine living in a city designed to mimic an ecosystem. Instead of harvesting our energy from a monoculture of fossil fuels, Biodiversity principles maximize the number of renewable energy species. Buildings function like plants and trees, converting solar energy and breathing fresh air. Bicycles, pedestrians, and low-emitting vehicles evolve into unique niches to minimize competition over city roadways. And wastes and resources are kept within a circular economy. In nature, the waste from one organism often becomes the food for another. Our agricultural and food processing waste and your coffee grounds can be converted into clean energy to power our homes and cars. Instead of opening new mines for scarce resources, corporations can form symbiotic relationships to repurpose each other's waste and save costs. Now, I know this sounds idealistic, but the reality is, examples like this are already taking root around the world, all the way from Kalenborg, Denmark, to here in Rochester, New York. We have to accept that human innovations are not the only, or maybe even best path to sustainability. The more we learn about ecology, the more we realize that nature has already created solutions for many of the challenges we now face but it has taken millions of years of trial and error, a luxury we simply do not have for responding to climate change, water scarcity, and pollution. Instead of recreating the wheel, we must listen to nature now. So, the next time you walk outside, look around and marvel at the complexity and efficiency of the ecosystem around you. And take note, because the natural innovations you see may be the ones that save us.